Welcome to Exploring the Scripture Readings for Sunday's Liturgy, Session 30, 12th Sunday in Ordinary Time, Year B. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in us the fire of your divine wisdom, knowledge, and love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today, as we continue with our Sunday Bible study, actually, what the church has done is each week, the church has given us readings from the scriptures. Again, as I mentioned, the gospel readings, they follow in sequence. For the most part, where the gospel ended last week, it begins within that section the following week. And that sets the theme for the liturgy. In presenting the liturgy this way, we're doing a kind of Bible study, studying the scripture from the gospel's theme and seeing how the Old Testament applies to this and some readings from the New Testament, how they apply. Depends on the season of the year, the changes. But this year we're in the gospel of Mark. And we're talking about the Gospel of Mark, keeping in mind, as I've repeated often, the Gospel of Mark, although it appears second in the Bible, is actually the first Gospel written. It was written about the year 60. So that's approximately 30 or more years after the resurrection of Jesus. And yet what Mark has done, he's taking the message of Jesus as he heard it preached and shared to those closest to Jesus. And he's developed the gospel. Really it's kind of a genius idea in many ways that Mark could take all these events that really weren't put together all the time and make a gospel, make put them in sequence. So today we read a gospel from Mark, keeping in mind it's a kind of Bible study that we do. Each week the church gives us a Bible study. And so this week, Gospel according to Mark. On that day, as evening drew near, Jesus said to his disciples, let us cross to the other side. He was speaking about crossing the lake, the lake of Gethsemane, uh, yes, excuse me, the lake of Galilee. He was crossing that lake. And keeping in mind, the lake of Galilee was a lake that was surrounded by hills, mountains, and sometimes the winds came and blew down into this lake. So when the apostles and others set out, it could be a very calm scene. But then suddenly that wind came. Suddenly a storm arose because these winds come down from the mountain and cause sudden storms. So we'll keep that in mind as we read the gospel. So Jesus says, let us cross the Sea of Galilee to the other side. Leaving the crowd, they took Jesus with them in the boat, just as he was. So it wasn't going to be a long trip, just as he was. So Jesus was going with them. A violent squall came up and waves were breaking over the boat so that it was already filling up. They're beginning to take water. Water is beginning to fill the boat. And now the apostles, disciples, are now beginning to become afraid. So this violent squall begins. And it's such a violent squall that now they think they're going to drown. Jesus was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. Again, keeping in mind, that many of the things that are said in the Gospels and the Scriptures have a twofold meaning. They're teaching us a lesson. They tell us what happened, but we get behind what happened and we learn about the person it's happening to or the group it's happening to. So it's saying here, Jesus was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. It's a violent storm. Jesus trusts the presence of God. So a violent storm is not enough to bring fear to Jesus. So 
Then what happened? The apostles, disciples, they're so afraid that they wake Jesus up. They woke him and said, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? They're in a panic. They're really afraid. <laughs> Jesus, what they're really saying here is not get up and help us calm the storm or any of that. They're saying every person for himself or herself. The idea, get up, take care of yourself. Doesn't concern you that we are perishing. So they still see Jesus in a very human sense. So they're concerned. And wake up and take care of yourself. Jesus woke up, rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, be quiet, be still. What Mark has done here, <clears throat> he realizes now that Jesus has been raised. Jesus is with God. Jesus is God. And what Mark has done is set back into the gospel these divine images of Jesus. And so it happens here. Jesus calms the sea. But he calms the sea as though he's casting out demons. Quiet, be still. Back in Jesus' day, people believed that when a storm in the sea erupted, it was because the evil spirits were causing it. The evil spirits were violent. The evil spirits were at work. So Jesus doesn't just calm the storm. Jesus rebukes the sea. And he says to the sea, be quiet, be still. So he's rebuking as though it's an evil spirit. The wind ceased and there was great calm. Jesus has exercised in the sense, cast out the devil, evil spirits from the waters. So there's a great calm. And then he asked them, why are you terrified? Do you not have faith? Jesus believed God was with him. Jesus <clears throat> also, <clears throat> Jesus who is God, also put his trust in God's creation. So he's saying, have faith. Everything in the world is under God's power. Back in Jesus' day, the people believed that every single thing that happened was caused by God. So when God allowed things to happen, God did that on purpose. So now a storm arose. God, in their mind, caused the storm to arise. And in Jesus' mind, who knew the made about creation, the storm arose, but he knows that God is in control. The message behind the message, <clears throat> in our life, storms arise. There's going to be many storms, but we have to trust God. Like Jesus, we have to remain calm. There's a story I repeated before about Pope John the 23rd. Pope John the 23rd was running the church, of course, caring for the church. And he cared for a great deal. He carried a great load in a sense. But as he told someone, he goes to bed at night. He says, God, I took care of your church during the day. Now you take care of it while I sleep. The idea is he's like Jesus. He's going to sleep. He'll sleep calmly. Things will be treacherous in the world. There'll be joys. There'll be sorrows. There'll be tragedies. But John the 23rd trusted that everything was in God's control. The storms would happen while he slept, but God was in control. So Jesus asked them, why were you terrified? Do you not have faith? Do you not believe that God is in control of creation? In the storms in our life, we're called to believe that God is in control of creation. We still have to pray, and we do pray. We pray that God will hear us and that God will work through us in many ways. God can control creation, but it's not like God is saying, okay, next thing I'm going to do is this, this, this. No. God has set up creation in such a way that much of what happens depends upon us, our prayerfulness, our good deeds, the way we act. The storms will arise, 
but then we can say, well, God works with us. God doesn't look down and say, okay, I'll work despite you. God works with us. And that's the message here. We're going to have storms in our lives, unexpected storms, but God works with us. Why are you concerned? Let God work with you and trust God. The saints went through some terrible situations, but they trusted that God was with them. Do you not have faith, Jesus said to them. So Jesus doesn't just calm the storm. He rebukes the storm. And now he's telling his disciples, really believe that God is at work. In our life, we sometimes have a great deal of wonderment, questions. God, where are you? Things are going bad. I need your help. God says, have faith. And it takes strong faith to believe that God is at work when we see no results. And so that's what it's about. Do you have faith? And now the disciples, they were filled with great awe and said to one another, who then is this whom even the, sea, the wind and the sea obey? Who is this person that is in the boat with us? Who is Jesus? They had to learn that when they were a companion of Jesus through their life, they saw him as an ordinary person with great powers. But they didn't see him with power to control the universe. That's a power of God. There are commentators who believe what they call this a post-resurrection story. What that really means is that people from up after the resurrection, they wanted to explain that God's power was always present, even though they didn't see it. And so they would present a message as a symbol, a picture of really what God, what God was working through Jesus. So the disciples saw him as an ordinary human being like themselves, who suddenly rebukes the storm who suddenly has this tremendous power over evil spirits. So Mark takes this and he's giving us a message. The message is Jesus is God. After all these centuries, that's the message. Jesus is God and he proves it by calming the sea, by casting out the demons, by having this power. It's meant to be a faith message for us. Oh, you have little faith. <clears throat> Do you really trust that God is with you? Then, as I mentioned, we go back to the first readings and they reinforce the gospel. And so we go back to the first reading from the book of Job. In the book of Job, Job has been tempted badly. Job lost his whole family. Three men come to Job and they're trying to say, Job, you've committed some sins. Otherwise, this wouldn't be happening to you. The only reason they saw evil happening was because someone sinned. But the message in Job is that life is difficult. There will be things we'll have to confront in our life. Even a young man comes to Job and tries to convince Job that it must be some sin he committed. And Job keeps saying, I didn't commit any sin. I was trustworthy with God. And then Job begins to brag a little bit. And finally, God becomes a little upset with Job. And Job now hears God speak to him. And the reading for this week is from Job, when God is speaking to Job. So from the book of Job, the Lord addressed Job out of the storm and said, so Job is in the middle of a storm. Everything's going wrong for Job. It's a physical storm here in the story, but it's also a storm that means to, that's meant to say, we have storms in our life. There are things that go wrong. And yet in the midst of that storm, we have to say, but God is here. God is with us. We trust God. So the Lord addressed Job out of the storm and said, and now God is going to come down very heavily on Job. He's going to rebuke Job 
he's going to tell Job off and challenge Job's thinking. And so God says to Job, who's shut within doors the sea? When it burst forth from the womb. Who contained the waters, God is saying, when it began, when it burst forth from the womb? What God is saying here is, look at the sea. It's in certain boundaries. Who, who shut it within the doors and kept it in that boundary when it first was born? God says, when I made the clouds its garments, try to put ourselves back in that era. We don't know how storms began. We don't know the idea of the nature, how it worked. And for people of those days, they'd see these clouds coming. And as the clouds came, they would eventually, of course, bring storms. And so they saw it coming. And to them, God was clothing the storm in clouds. God says, when I made the clouds its garments and thick darkness its swaddling bands. When it was born, when God wrapped up this child who was the storm, that God is saying, I put the swaddling clothes on this. That's their image of a storm, though. They looked out, they saw the dark clouds coming. And so God is saying, yeah, who was around when I did these things? And God continues to speak. When I set limits for it and fastened the bar of its door. Where, 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 where were you, Job, when I did these things? When I set limits for the sea? How come it only goes so far? How come it doesn't flood the whole earth at this time? So I fastened the door, the bar of its door. God is saying, it's like putting a bar down across a door. It can't go beyond this bar, this door. God set the doors of the sea, the limits. And God said, thus far to the sea, you, you shall come, but no further. So God set the limits. And here shall your proud waves be stilled. So here the power just ebbs out, ends. It's very poetical. In fact, it's, it's one of the highly poetical uh, readings in the book of Job. It talks about God controlling the sea in an image. An image of locking a door, giving the sea certain limits that it could not go beyond. And God is the one who established these limits. It didn't flood the earth. It only flooded so far. The storm, of course, connects with the gospel reading. Storms arise in life. Job has his strong storms. And at the same time, God is the one who controls the storms of life for those who trust God. And what God is saying here to Job, have faith. Although he's doing it in a very harsh way, we might say. He's challenging Job to think about it and to accept it. Job will eventually have to say, I put my hand over my mouth. I realize, God, I, I misspoke. I should have trusted you. Then we go to the responsorial psalm. Give thanks to the Lord. His love is everlasting. No matter how bad things get, we can thank God because God loves us. No matter what happens, God loves us. The first verse, they who sail the, ship, the sea in ships, trading on the deep waters, these saw the works of the Lord and his wonders in the abyss. Trading over the seas, that was done very often in Jesus' day. They would go up the coast and very often trade. The traders is where the messages, the stories that Jesus told began to spread. It was through the traders that the message of the gospel was able to spread to so many places. So we simply make that statement. It was simply the work of the Lord that was going through the, over the seas that brought God's word. Give thanks to the Lord. His love is everlasting. The Lord's love is everlasting. The Lord's command raised up a storm wind, which tossed its waves on high. We get an image. We see the waves going up. Whatever you've seen, either in a movie or in real life, 
When a storm arises, the waves come. They mounted up to heaven. They sank to the depths. If you've seen it in movies again, when the waves come, they lift us way up. We can see for a long, long area. Then all of a sudden, they disappear and we drop like dropping in an elevator. Suddenly, as all waves around us, then another wave comes on and we go up and we can see from a distance. They mounted up to the heavens. They sank to the depths. Their hearts melted away in their plight. They thought, this is the end. Their hearts melted away. Give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is everlasting. They cried to the Lord in their distress. From their straits, the Lord rescued them. The Lord hushed the storm to a gentle breeze, and the billows of the sea were still. Suddenly, the storm passed. Suddenly, there was calm. They see this as God at work. Somehow, with God's power, God's love, the storm is passed. The last verse, they rejoiced that they were calm. And he brought them to their desired haven, to their shore, to where they were going. Let them give thanks to the Lord for the Lord's kindness and the Lord's deeds to all of us. Give thanks to the Lord for the Lord is good. And the Lord's love is everlasting. The theme, following through. Then from there, we move on, of course, to the second reading. Second reading, it's from St. Paul to the Corinthians. Again, the second reading follows in sequence from an area around the week before. And so it happens now as it continues. And it's not really written down as part of the theme but it's the scripture and this theme fits very well into the scripture. It helps us to understand a deeper message of the scripture. So Paul here in a letter to the Corinthians, the second letter to the Corinthians for many commentators seems to be a collection of various letters that is put together. But here it talks about the love of Christ. Brothers and sisters, the love of Christ impels us once we have come to the conviction that all that one died for all. So Paul is saying, now just think about this. The love of God tells us that one died for all. He's a cross pointing to the Lord. Therefore, all have died. He's saying we all died in Christ. He indeed died for all. So that those who live might no longer live for themselves but for him who for their sake died and was raised. One of the people, one of the questions people ask often is the idea, why did Christ have to go through such suffering? And what Paul is saying here, it wasn't because Christ had any repentance to do, Christ never sinned. And Christ could have saved us without going through all that pain, all that horrible crucifixion. But for him who for their sake died and for her. In other words, for all people who died for, for who Jesus died for. That's what he, why he died the way he did. If he simply died and said, okay, this is the end of my life. He might not have left any impression. But the fact is, he took upon himself our life. He died to show us how much he loved us. But at the same time, he died by simply reaching out and saying, we die with him. We're meant to die to this world in a sense. Some of the things that attract us away from God. So we die for that reason. Consequently, the writer writes, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. So we don't see this person now as just human. We don't see Jesus as just human anymore, not according to the flesh. We're going deeper into the person's spirit. Even if we once knew Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him so no longer. What that means is even though he was one of us, he was among us, we knew him, we saw him as one of us, 
we knew him in the flesh. But now things have changed. We do not know him in that way so no lo any longer. So whoever is in Christ is a new creation. Baptism. And through our baptism, we put our life into the life of Christ. We become one with Christ. It's what the scripture tells us. We become adopted children. The scriptural meaning of adoption was not simply somebody who's brought from outside, somebody who's brought from within and becomes almost biological by our way of thinking. But the reality is part of the family. Once we are baptized, we are a member of the family. In reality, old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. So we no longer think according to the flesh. We no longer see Jesus as simply a human being among us who had this great power. We now know that Jesus is God. And being God, Jesus can calm the storms. We call upon Jesus in the storms of our life. We move back to the gospel. The gospel tells us about Jesus standing up, calming the storms, but he rebukes the storms. No matter how difficult things become in life, no matter how threatening, no matter how much we need Christ, Christ is always present to us. And he'll always be there to help us. We do have storms in life. There's no person in this world who can escape these storms. And we pray. We pray and we say, God, where are you? We don't hear always an answer to prayer. We're praying that God will help us to understand and to really help us trust in times of, pa of passion and death. Where is God? God is with us. God is there. And sometimes God appears to be asleep. Sometimes Jesus is just still sleeping. Let's wake him. And, and let's tell Jesus, Jesus, <laughs> you've got to be concerned for this world. Doesn't it concern you that we are perishing? The perishing that God would be concerned about is the salvation of our life, our soul, our person. Not just me, but us. God's salvation is for the whole community. And so we look at the scripture and we can say, well, who is this who the wind and sea obey? Our faith tells us it's Christ. And our faith tells us we have to trust Jesus. He may appear to be asleep, but Jesus is always with us. May the light of Christ lead me, the power of Christ be with me, the wisdom of Christ inspire me, the word of Christ instruct me, the shelter of Christ protect me, the hand of Christ hold me, and the love of Christ be in me. May the grieving find support in me, the sad find joy in me. The depressed find hope in me. The weak find strength in me. The doubters find faith in me. The rejected find love in me. And the world find Christ in me. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.